Well, hello, Sublation Media viewers and readers and listeners. It's me again, Douglas Lane, and you're about to watch an interview with Conrad Hamilton. It's, uh, it's October 12th, 2022, and so in this interview, we discussed the critique of the Gotha program by Marx. That's the first half. In the second half, for patrons, we'll be discussing, or we did discuss, Moish Pistone, uh, the author of Time, uh, Labor, and Social Domination. So you'll hear about that in the Parrot Room. If you'd like to become a Patreon supporter, now is a really good time to do so for two reasons. One, we've just introduced annual memberships, which means that if you sign up for the year, um, you get 16% off, and that means two months free. And you're also putting down a chunk of change to really um, commit to supporting us. Right now, we are printing books. We have uh, our first book by Todd McGowan available for pre-order um, from our own website in the United States and really across the world in, on Amazon and, and other vendors. Becoming a Patreon supporter today means uh, in, investing in the future of sublation and, and means that you believe that, that uh, this project has some value and that the, the left in America and around the world could use uh, more voices like the ones that you hear here. So, here, here. In any case, um, you're about to hear a conversation about the Critique of the Gotha program. Check us out on Patreon, and thanks for listening and watching. The death of God is about the drying up of a horizon of meaning and of a whole form of human life. Where do we stand in the illusion it makes? What kind of space are we invited into? The material relations between people become social relations between things. When we look at toasters, corn, and TVs, we don't we see We still, to a large extent, live in the interregnum between, between worlds, if you will, or between paradigms. Not many people in the history of the world have faced that. Diet soap is a sublation media podcast but um but we'll get into the gotha program in a second but you just said that you thought that the opposition to the predominant culture in the 90s particularly took a, a kind of a fascist form at least aesthetically because i was mentioning uh, how yeah. i was watching the, my chemical romance the teenagers song and relating to it at the age of 51 shows i think it's something is stunted in me but anyhow um why do you think it took a fascist form in the in the nineties? Well, I just think there was no way of of thinking, you know, really class struggle, you know, in the conditions of collective revolt in that period. And so I think that, you know, I mean, like I like to think of these sort of touchstones of cinema, right, um, of that mm. period, right. If you think of something like the like the Fight Club, right, you know, mm. um, in terms of this kind of you know hyper macho aggression, and you know, I mean, like it's a complex work. I mean, both the book and the film. Um, but I do think certainly there's an element of romanticization, but I mean, you look at something like the matrix, right. Where it's like, you know, this isn't like a mass uprising, right. It's like a very Manichaean and like simplistic notion of like the real world versus the fake world, you know, mm -hmm. which Zizek has, has critiqued, right. Um, mm -hmm. you know, variously, uh, asking for a third pill, but I mean, then you look at like, you know, how this world is sort of redeemed, Right. And it's by this sort of, um, you know, white guy who's sort of a transparent allegory for Christ. Right. You know, in his small cabal of uh, uh, allies and leather suits. Right. Um, mm -hmm. You know, who commit these, you know, extreme acts of violence. Right. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and kind of purge the world of its kind of uh, the rotten parasites who are manipulating it. Um, and so I think that and actually it's interesting. Right. Because if you look at those kind of people, like the Wachowskis, I guess, mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, I think I saw like, what is the new Matrix movie? It's like, uh, I mean, it's, it's not, it's not even memorable. I mean, the title is, is memorable. Is it Matrix? Uh, Matrix, um, again, Returns. on, on digital streaming. I think that's actually the title. It's a, the Netflix original ne Matrix or something like that. Um, <clears throat> yeah. yeah so I, in that, so in that, it's like, in that, it's like, you know, I mean, obviously it's intended, um, you know, as a, uh, among other things, right. A critique of, um, uh, the sort of, you know, misappropriate, perceived misappropriation of this as an allegory, right, for like, um, you know, sort of far right communities, right, the sort of red pill, blue pill, and this kind of thing. Um, but I mean, I, I do, I do go with Lukash on this when I say like, no, no art, no philosophy is innocent, 
you know, and I mean, I think that, you know, if it was possible to quote misappropriate something like the matrix in relation to the ostensible intentions of the original authors, um, it also has to do with um, not just necessarily and so explicitly, um, you know, the fascistic undercurrents of, of the matrix in its original form, which I still think is a good film, all else, um, but also, um, you know, just how general this allegory is, right? You yeah. know, I mean, it functions completely, you know, it's extremely platonic, right, in that way. And actually, I think there's a funny story about uh, Baudrillard, because in the beginning of The Matrix, they see, uh, you know, there's a copy of, of Baudrillard and Simulacra and Simulacrum, which is, um, which Neo hides something like a disc uh, in the first scene. And I think it was something like um, Baudrillard was reached out to comment about uh, the film and he claimed that, um, you know, it has nothing to do with his work, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, because like, uh, you know, I mean, it's like this, you know, Baudrillard's work absolutely, you know, it doesn't have to do with, um, you know, the way that there's uh, simply like a, a real world and a false world, right? Um, you know, mm -hmm. it has to do with the way that um, more and more, um, you know, the very nature of the relationship between reality and appearance is falsified or internally generated. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and how like there's no, you know, how in this context, there's no simplistic appeal to an exteriority that really has any tenability. Right. Anymore. Right. How mm -hmm. increasingly, you know, and I think you can definitely see some parallels with um, De Boer, right, which we, we've discussed. Yeah. Um, but I mean, like, I like what Baudrillard said about it, though. Baudrillard said that the Matrix is the kind of film that that the Matrix would create if it was trying to disguise the existence of the Matrix, um, which I think is a really, really interesting comment vis-a-vis -vis capitalism. Right. Well, you know. I, I want to I, I want to go back to the Fight Club. <clears throat> you yeah. mentioned Fight Club. And um, I read that novel as well as, uh, you know, b I think. Yeah. Before I saw the movie and um, and it to, to me, it struck me as a reworking of uh, Catcher in the Rye. Mm -hmm. It was mm -hmm. not it was not um, a particularly. uh unique or original work even though in lots of parts lo lots of things were were different about uh fight club from um catch and rye but the 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 central character seemed to be very much a holland caulfield kind of character who was looking for a way to be authentic and connected in a world which seemed filled with phonies um and so, and and especially the ending of the the of um, uh, Fight Club had a similar quality to the ending of Catcher in the Rye, um, because it, in the original novel, if I'm remembering correctly, the whole book had been written from some sort of the vantage point of the author in a sanitarium, like yeah. after he's been you know given some some help um, in terms of his mental. I'm going to turn off the. Uh, my my Facebook is chiming, but um, I, I think I, feel I think that's so. I think that's I think that's part of the part and parcel of the problem, right? Is like when you approach, you know, the negation of the system from the standpoint of the attempt to achieve or distill some kind of authentic experience, right? Right, yeah. obviously. Mm -hmm. Or well, although I don't know, I feel on the one hand, um, you can't actually with from within the system find authenticity. And perhaps even the search for authenticity is um, uh, part of the problem. On the other hand, I I think that seeking out, I mean, beyond just seeking out uh, your basic needs, if you're someone who's like been cast aside or made marginal within the system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, beyond that, seeking out authenticity is a, is a way to end up on the path towards seeking out transformation. Um, mm -hmm. but that, that will often be where people start from, um, uh, especially when they're teenagers, which is where we started, right? But when they're young and yeah. they're feeling like they're about to be brought into the world of adulthood, of the world of the system made to conform to, to this world. Um, well, capitalism is the, great. Capitalism is great at transformation, right? Um, I just think that, I think that the, the, the general consequence of, you know, failing to see the lack of authenticity, you know, as the cause rather than the symptom, right, of the overall of our larger economic problems. Um, I think it leads to an incapacity to differentiate from um, the forms of uh, novelty 
or uh, transformation that capitalism engenders, um, you know, and, uh, you know, a sort of authentic, if you will, transformation of the economic structure. And um, I think we see that um, very, very strongly in, um, uh, you know, if you look at someone like Deleuze, right, like, you know, in Anti-Oedipus, right, like he almost like cosmologizes um, capitalism, you know, he's like, oh, well, you know, socialism, this is just this sort of like, uh, you know, sterile kind of thing that just, um, you know, reproduces, you know, he's talking about state socialism that reproduces pre-capitalist um, relations of domination. And of course, he doesn't, it's a little ridiculous, right, when you consider how much transformation actually occurred within socialist states. Um, but I mean, the result of this is barring the transformation beyond capitalism, which he's attempting to achieve, capitalism becomes like this um, you know, transcendentalized, uh, uh, you know, innovative power. Right. When you say, when you think about the amount of transformation that occurred within the socialist state, socialist states, which states are you thinking about particularly? And at what period of time? Well, I mean, I think, I think most canonically like Russia and China, right. You know, in right. terms of like the total, the total, the radical transformations and, and, you know, and very, very like Promethean in a but, way. But, and yeah, but it, those transformations were not transformations from capitalism into socialism. Well, it depends what we it depends what we define socialism, right? Because a lot of people well, I mean, following state no, revolution, no, you could even characterize if, even that as an immediate stage. Doesn't have to depend on that. You you could yeah. you could agree that that those were socialist states, but the starting point wasn't capital or capitalism. Uh, yeah, no, that the, well, that that wasn't the starting point. But I do think that in a more global sense, it still had a very strong influence because I don't think like. You know, even the I mean, beyond the fact that these countries, both the varying degrees, had working classes that were important to the advancement of these ideas, if not their decisive victory. Mm -hmm. um, and the Russian and Chinese examples would be different that way. Um, I think that the entire program, right, associable with what we might term <clears throat> Marxism, right, even in its, you know, kind of uh, Russian or third worldist adaptation. Um, you know, I don't think that that ever would have been forged were it not for you know, um, the gains made and, and the, the ideological developments of the working class right, in the most industrialized nations of, in the world, you know, and Marx's work is a product of that. Right. So so it may not have been directly a transition from capitalism, but it still depended on that, right, because those were the kind of values, to some extent anyway, or to a large extent, they were trying to instantiate even within well, a less developed context. Sure, right. So it depended upon the dynamic of capitalism emerging. Um, the transformation yeah. mm -hmm. was uh, in line with the kinds of transformations that had been seen for uh, uh, since the end of the 17th century, uh, you know, throughout Europe and, you know, in a, at an exponentially you know, faster rate throughout the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, but now we're going to get to the critique of the Gotha program and the, and the, um, I like the little, I like the little preliminary though. I like that. Yeah. yeah. And I think, yeah, we're, getting, I I think we're getting, I think we're going to get to the basis of our disagreement about this text too. <laughs> yeah, I think so too. Cause I, I in the second half, I want to talk to you about, Moish Stone and his mm -hmm. notion of traditional Marxism, and I do feel as though this is th that that my uh, uh, um, admiration for and attempt to incorporate uh, Stone's understanding of Marxism into my own understanding is what sets my uh, understanding apart from yours, and I think uh, the majority of of the Marxist lefts. Um, understanding um mm -hmm. regardless of whether they embrace china or think that we can achieve social democracy in a in a sure, in a, sure. like on a swedish model or or um even you know uh align themselves with um uh, what like someone like heinrich grossman who and or yeah. you know or trotsky mm -hmm. or whatever it there's a there's this um understanding that moish bastone mm -hmm. articulated that uh, that I try to understand uh, yeah. and and incorporate and that I think should be challenged and we'll do that in the second half but to, bef before we get to that you wrote a piece for Sublation magazine it's a long piece it's called the society of the social consumption fund marx and labor certificates that's the title that's at the top of it right now we can re yeah. re we'll probably retitle that as something like the critique of the gotha program was sexy and we'll put like a couple people in like bathing suits at the top to get those clicks yeah going. that'd be that'd be typical <laughs> classic sublation move you know epic, epic gamer <laughs> gamer move right there like that, yeah. That's right. um so uh uh but you start out talking about how um marx's method 
did not lead him to define or describe scientific socialism or socialism at all very often. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. um, but the, what you are aiming at in the piece is to, to understand what was, what Marx meant by labor certificates particularly mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the yeah. limitation of his suggestions in the critique of the Gotha program. And, you know, um, you, you submitted, submitted this at a time when Spencer Leonard was leaving sublation and he was mm -hmm. giving you one sort of edit. And then I stepped in in my typical uh, left com way and gave you my kind of uh, uh, edit. Well, sometimes I think like an actual editor, sometimes more like some sort of ideologue. Um, but maybe, it's, I'm a, maybe, take... it's a, maybe it's appropriate that a piece on, you know, su successive stages of transition ended up being published, you know, when there were stages <laughs> of transition. That's right. Definitely going through some transitions right now. Um, but uh, what I thought we'd do is talk about, um, like, I would take on my, you know, full ideologue position and, and mm -hmm. uh, give you an opportunity, though, to to describe what you think the limits of uh, Marx's labor certificates were and um and and what brought you to this uh to to write about this today so like what was it about marx's uh critique of the gotha program that made you decide that th it needed to be explored and expanded upon and expounded upon now sure sure well i mean i think that you know um daniel tut for example he's sort of i think quite effectively uh talked about how um, we could probably uh, break sort of like the or, or divide, uh, you know, kind of the Western or the American left more specifically um, into or socialist left into uh, three columns. Right. Um, and one of those uh, is, um, I guess, what you'd characterize as sort of tankies like Marxist Leninists. Right. You have some sort of, you know, sometimes equivocal, but, uh, you know, a sort of loyalty in any case. Uh, to the legacy of actually uh, existing socialism and, and the Third International, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and another one uh, is sort of DSA, right? Democratic Socialism, you know, Sanders, Reformist Program, you know, a certain kind of emulation of Scandinavia and all of that. Um, and the third one he characterized as being, and I, I, I am not going to be repeating his exact terms, um, but it's sort of a, an anarcho-communist kind of formation um, that has become very, very, um, you know, involved um, with value theoretical analysis, right, to the extent that that um, anarcho-communist or left-communist impulse uh, is premised on the idea that, you know, we need to uh, actually uh, get rid of the value form itself, right, uh, mm -hmm. you know, in order to achieve a higher state, um, which, by the way, like even Marxist Leninists would not uh, disagree with, right, if you look at state and revolution, it's just a question of, you know, how that, how we go about that, right, and the speed with mm -hmm. which we go about that. Um, but, uh, and I think that, uh, you know, I think you can see different different aspects of that third tendency. I mean, I think one um, is that, you know, often there's a focus on extra proletarian forms of organization, right? Sort of like lumpen, um, you know, and uh, the possibility of the riot form, right? Which we see very commonly in, in something like endnotes. Um, but I guess, you know, I mean, I think that for me, um, you know, I mean, I've been identified at times. Uh, you've dubbed me as a, a contemporary Stalinist. Um, you know, I'm yeah. probably... I'm probably about as ambivalent about this term as you are, as being having your face grafted on Mao and the banner for sublation socialism. <laughs> right, right. Um, but, but I just meant that I think that, um, you know, one thing is that, you know, I, I do think I'm probably closest to Marxist Leninism, right, mm -hmm. uh, of these three uh, categories. Um, but I do think that, you know, it's very, very important to uh, engage with this uh, uh, different literature. And I think obviously um, the critique of the Gotha program is a really, really important uh, text. Um, because this is what I, I sort of point out, right? I mean, Marx was, you know, um, an avid, I mean, uh, appreciative in certain respects, but also very much a critic of of utopian socialism, you know, sort of Fourier's, I always like this one, you know, they're, they're going to salinate the seas and make them taste like lemonade, you know, in the mm. higher stage of... It's um, my favorite too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's all anyone actually knows about Fourier's that he proposed that. Um, but... <laughs> yeah. Also, also, I've read a little bit more, but that's all I recall. Yeah. All I know is all, I, I, yeah, I read a whole I read his whole book and all I remember is that and that he wants to um, uh, pay government employees to have sex with people who are, who are lonely, sexual minimum. Um, but yeah, like postal workers, like they'll show up to your house, deliver <laughs> yeah, your yeah, mail. Really? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> For men and women. Yeah. Right, um, right. No. Right. And who knows which one you'd get on a given day? It might be a different <laughs> gender each day. And these days that could be you know, three, four or five different genders. But the yeah. point is, 
Yes, I think that's a good idea. I think lonely people um, probably want to spend a little extra money and have them talk to you as well. Yeah. That would be good. Well, he also he also hates Jews and Chinese and, and English people. I think though he's French, so I guess the latter point has to be forgiven. You know, is a necessary. I'm going to say like trait. of the three, I'm with him one time. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, but yeah, but I think that this text is really important because this is what I said. You know, Marx, uh, you know, was critical of some of the um, sort of wild uh, propositions, right, put forth uh, by the utopian socialists, um, you know, not not wholly unappreciative, right? And certain aspects of that, um, I'm thinking of Owen in particular, do end up synthesized in this text. Um, but, you know, part of this is that, you know, Marx was attempting to uh, pursue a kind of dialectical method to focus on, um, you know, a representation of the future from the standpoint of the, the present, Right. So kind of following naturally from the is rather than going immediately to the ought. Um, and so there's not really many texts. Right. Um, you know, very, very few. I and mean, you have comments in like the third volume of Capital and the realm of freedom and this kind of thing. But there's really not many texts where Marx, you know, kind of stipulates what he would imagine, um, you know, socialist or communist transition to look like. Right. Um, and so that I feel like if we're having these kind of debates between these sort of, um, you know, ideological uh, factions within the socialist left, this is a really, really important text to uh, analyze, to try to reach any kind of conclusion um, regarding um, to what extent, you know, the ideas being put forth um, by these different segments are in conformance with what Marx was proposing. Of course, whether we should just do what he was proposing is another question. Um, mm -hmm. And one that, you know, is also addressed um, mm -hmm. within my text. Um, but um, yeah, um, you know, so in the, uh, I mean, the text itself, of course, is a response to uh, the Gotha program, right, which was uh, put forth by the German Social Democratic Party um, in 1875. And I believe that, um, you know, Marx actually got, you know, he, um, his response was based on a version that was published in the newspaper. Um, and it was written, I think, only for about nine or 10 or like a dozen people. Uh, and it was never the critique of the Gotha program was written for nine or 10 or a dozen people uh, and was never actually published. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, you know, the, the Gotha program, um, you know, its adoption in 1875 is usually associated um, with the uh, triumph of uh, Lasallian thought, right, um, over uh, Marxist thought. And I won't elaborate on that too much, but it is interesting to note that um, in 1891, uh, they went to adopt a new program, um, and that was the Erford program, mm -hmm. right? Um, and at that point, um, Engels decided, and this was after Marx's death, which I believe was 1883, mm -hmm. uh, Engels decided uh, to publish this text, which Marx had originally only written for, you know, a small audience within the party, mm -hmm. um, you know, in order to help influence and sway debates that were occurring. Um, and while the Erfurt program was by no means uh, totally satisfactory, right, um, mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, Engels or some of the people who styled themselves as kind of arch Marxists, um, you know, it was widely considered uh, by them to have been an improvement, right, over the uh, 1875 Gotha program, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, uh, you know, in terms of what I write, um, you know, I mean, of course, we, uh, I think anyone with any any familiarity um, with the critique of the Gotha program is aware that um, Marx um, puts forth different stages of transition, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so one of these is the dictatorship of the proletariat, right, uh, which is, um, you know, in a sense, the continuance of class society, uh, albeit with the proletariat and dominance, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, as a sort of, um, uh, for the construction of the foundation uh, of a transition to a different kind of society or socialist sort of society. Um, you know, and then we pass into uh, the lower stage of communism, um, you know, in which um, you have uh, labor certificates, right? Uh, you know, and quote, equal exchange, right? Uh, based on the principle of labor time, right? Mm -hmm. um, though, as, as I'm sure you'll, you won't hesitate to bring up there, how equal that is would still be quite contestable. Right. Um, and in the third stage, we get, uh, you know, a society uh, in which, uh, you know, from each according to their abilities, uh, to each according to their needs, which um, actually Spencer Leonard helpfully uh, added uh, in his revision uh, was originally a quote of uh, Blanqui, which I was not actually aware of. So I like that. He just went full on with that one and added the reference to my text. So all credit to, to Spencer. Right, right. Um, so, okay. So, um, which, you know, I'm, I'm, I've got the critique of the Gotha program open and I'm going to confess, um, when I'm trying to find the section on the la labor certificates here, um, is it called, were they called certificates? Well, I don't think or? they call, I don't think you, I, I don't, I think it's, if you write certificates, you'll find it. 
Yeah, I'm not sure. Okay. If, I'm not sure if the exact phrase "labor certificates" is used. Um, okay. You know, and um, yeah, the, I mean, the thing it's, I, it's, I would it's, say it's, most it's of all, a, it's, yeah, continue. Yeah, I found it. Well, the thing I'd say most of all is that your characterization of the critique of the Gotha program is completely accurate, and yet I think could be misleading because it, while it's true that he does mention and mm -hmm. assert that there would be tra a transitional mm -hmm. period and and the, the that um, the, the dictatorship of the proletariat and the lower stage of, of yeah. communism and the full communism would be like the three pieces. Um, yeah. It is not the case that what he was primarily doing um, in the critique of the Gotha program was make, making positive assertions, right? I mean, the, yeah. the, 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 uh, the whole of it is really a, uh, um, written in in the style in this in this way he'll he'll take a quote from the the gotha program yeah. and then he, you know like a sentence like labor is a source of all wealth and all culture and then spend paragraphs explaining why that sentence and is in error yeah uh like in this case labor is not the source of all wealth nature is just as much a source of use values as labor um he starts out and so um uh, when he when he's making positive assertions or making claims about how socialism might arrive, he's doing so always in response to the the suggestions and assertions of the Gotha program, um, and so that shapes the kinds of things he addresses. Yeah. Right. He do, he doesn't. Uh, yeah, and I think I think yeah. Go ahead. I think in terms of the English reception. So again. You know, and, and I think it's going to be really helpful. I'm going to have to go over, you know, my actual points. But I think, mm -hmm. again, just as a, a preliminary to that, um, I think that the English reception in particular is shaped by the fact that, you know, the Gotha program itself is like very, very hard to come by in translation. The translations you find mm -hmm. are like really, really abysmal. Um, but in any case, I mean, I would stress that I think that the motivation surrounding the text, um, you know, um, given its obscurity uh, in Marx's lifetime, um, you know, and to what extent these things should be taken as affirmative propositions can be subjected to a lot of debate and historical scrutiny. Um, mm -hmm. You know, part of my, but you know, what my text is really responding to is the fact that, you know, certainly there are a lot of people who take this, these, these as, you know, very, very definitive kind of propositions. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, you know, if only because of that, um, you know, I think they need to be uh, critiqued for sort of uh, logical or economic coherency. Right. Um, right. So, you know, you could so, say that uh, you might be right, but, but the fact is a lot of people have taken that up you know, in a more literal way. Right. Right. That's true. And so, um, yeah, I mean, when our back and forth, you know, and by the way, this is going to be coming out on, Mon uh, uh, on Monday, I think I'll probably take a, a clip from our conversation now and run it on the okay. Sublation magazine show. Um, and then this will be for the diet soap podcast on Wednesday. Um, yeah. so the, the piece should be read. I mean, and it absolutely is, um, a good supplement to the actual critique of the Gotha program. And it's because it sets up, um, as you say, the way in which uh, the the, Gotha, the critique of the Gotha program is often deployed or, or or taken up by contemporary Marxists, and you know that could stretch back a hundred years or more. Uh, when I say contemporary Marxists, um, and it it focuses in on a text which I, you I think would like to marginalize, but which I think deserves to be read and understood, but just read very very carefully. Um, and uh, yeah. uh, which which would is not an introductory text. It's like wouldn't be where I would start. It's actually a very. Said, it, well, what it, was Marx? It, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, text what, because, what, what, what's Marx about? I wouldn't say. Oh, yeah. the critique of the Gotham program. You know, it's like, no, that's not a good place to begin. But what are you going to say? Well, it's an interesting text because you know um, the Gotham program is superficially quite simple. I think when you look over it, right? Mm -hmm. But I actually think that to understand it right, can be enormously difficult, right? And that's, that's you know, because, and I think it really, really requires a grounding, um, you know, in value theoretical analysis. You know, I don't think you'd be able to approach that otherwise. Um, and mm -hmm. I'll make clear, because I want to run through my critique, but but I'll make clear that I think part of the problem with the way people have approached, like, you know, if you look at someone like, uh, people like Cockshot and Cottrell in their book Towards a New Socialism, where they try to envision a kind of workable program um, based on uh, the propositions of the critique of the Gotha program, I think they get quite tangled up um, because of a lack of knowledge of value theory, right? Um, so, you know, yeah. I mean, Cockshot has been described as a cyber Stalinist, so I guess I'm sympathetic with him to that extent. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, I mean, part of it is like, 
you know, the, the, and, and so this will be clear. I want to go over what I what I say a little bit. But mm -hmm. so what I'll say here is that, you know, I mean, I think, you know, the, the dictatorship of the proletariat, as well as the higher stage of communism outlined by Marx, um, you know, there's not a lot of content to that um, in the text. Um, you know, and actually it would be interesting to analyze the historical reception of those. But I think most interesting in terms of things in the text um, is the uh, analysis of the lower stage of communism. Right. And that so, was I mean, one, what, one, one way to wait, think about your piece, which is coming out again on Monday, yeah. um, mm -hmm. is it's not a really a critique of the Gotha, not a critique of Marx's critique of the Gotha program, but more a critique of the way certain contemporary Marxists have taken up the, the text. Well, and I it, mean, to be, to be clear, fair? to be clear, I think that, um, you know, I think that it's a reading of Marx, but it's a reading of Marx that is premised on the idea Right. Um, which which has some basis in the historical reception, but it's premised on the idea um, that we can sort of, you know, that it's worthwhile to take these things seriously and to, right, to literally right. to literally and not and not and not treat them as just immediately self undermining as well. Yeah. Right? Um, but OK, so OK, so for instance, um, we could it's decide, as Cockshot maybe has decided, that um, the notion of these labor certificates could be taken up in isolation, uh, understood on their own and implemented by some sort of a socialist state as a way to transition away from capitalist society into the lower stage of communism or socialism. Right. Yeah. And that's, yeah, yeah. that's, yeah. that's a, the, and so what you want to do is say, okay, well, what, if we did that, what, how would these certificates actually function? What, what, how would they work? What, Absolutely, what and, and particularly, what... partic partic particularly on economic grounds. So let me um, mm. let me yeah, just kind of run, run through that. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that makes uh, the lower stage of communism, as by, as described by Marx, um, you know, a little bit uh, apparatic, right, uh, in its formulation, uh, is the way that he uh, declares that you know, um, if, if we talk about sort of value based exchange, it exists and it doesn't, right? Um, you know, and the manner uh, in which it 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 exists right is in the sense that um you know uh, you'll have something like a social consumption fund right um mm -hmm. and workers work and um you know they receive goods from the social consumption fund based on the labor time they perform right so the idea here is the exchange of equivalence right mm -hmm. um but in another sense it doesn't resemble value right because none of this is premised on the distinction right um you know between value and price right so if you actually look at marx's economic works right um you know obviously value and price are different Right. Uh, value is the substratum of price. Um, but, um, you know, uh, value is is conditioned by uh, or, the product, you know, socially necessary labor time. Right. We have. Um, so what we have here is a kind of a, a, a sort of imagined direct mechanism. Right. In this way. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, you're working, your time is calculated, you're exchanging, you know, that unit of time. Right. Um, for goods from the social consumption fund. Right. Um, and, and so I think that the question you have to ask. Right. And again, like we can. We can actually pose all kinds of interesting questions like, you know, um, to what extent would such a society be defined by, um, I use exchange in quotation marks, right, with the mm -hmm. social consumption fund um, versus like, you know, the simple provision of um, resources to those who needed it. But Marx obviously does assign a, cer a certain importance to it. Um, so I think that, you know, we really come up against uh, a few uh, logical issues. Right. right. Just declare. I just I want to restate what you just said. And so I, I yeah. make sure we're on the same page. The what what one thing that we're trying to do when we deploy these labor certificates to replace money is create a situation where to the greatest degree possible, um, the value of one's work is returned uh, in the form of of useful things. Um, well, not, not even, not know, even, not, yeah, not, not even really the value. Right. But yeah, I get your point. Yeah. Like, yeah, the, okay, I don't mean to say confusing terminologically. Yeah, yeah. Right. I mean, the, 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 the amount of work that you put in will result in you getting the same amount of stuff out. Yeah. Equal and representation, so one, labor, so, labor inputs for goods. Yeah. Right. So there's a labor certificate that records an hour, you one certificate per hour and mm. you work eight hours a day, then you can have eight, certificates you can then go to the common store um of of goods and say here i have these eight certificates i want yeah. one toaster which is worth one hour and i want uh, two loaves of bread which is worth an hour yeah uh you know and um 
and so you're not um, you're not being exploited. That's yeah. the idea. Um, and uh, you're not um, uh, you're also not creating a surplus um, for anyone either, because the labor is directly taken out as a means of consumption for the worker. It's not taken. It, but but Marx points out that in fact some of the work would have to be taken away from from the workers and reinvested into the means of production, reinvested into some sort yeah. of common fund for those who couldn't work, yeah. like Social Security. And so so the dream of the Gotha program to, to you know to create a fair distribution where what you put in is what you get out uh, can't mm-hmm. be achieved. Um, uh, th- that's one one thing that Mark starts with. Is like well, his reasoning, his, reason, his reasoning for that, right? Is that his, his reasoning mm-hmm. for that, right? Is it still based on um, again? So Marx Marx actually points out that you know the inadequacies of the system, but he right. points it out in a particular way, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and this is where my essay, I hope, offers something to this debate. Um, so mm-hmm. Marx's Marx's critique. I mean, we could we could we could read through it in full, um, but uh, and I think I have it here, right? Um, yeah. This equal right is an unequal right for unequal labor. Uh, uh, Right by its very nature can consist only in the application of an equal standard. Um, uh, And he says, uh, you know, this is the problem with this is that people are only regarded as workers and nothing more is seen in them, everything else being ignored. Further, one worker is married, another is not. One has more children than another and so on and so forth. Thus, with an equal performance of labor, and hence an equal in the social consumption fund, <laughs> one will in fact receive more than another, one will be richer than another, and so on. To avoid all these defects, right, instead of being equal, would have to be unequal, right? So what he's saying in that passage, right, is that it's still based on uh, a sort of one-dimensional uh, characterization of humans, right? Mm-hmm. A one-dimensional treatment of humans, right, as workers, right, who perform, uh, you know, sort of abstracted uh, work, Right, mm-hmm. know, mixing terms a little. You get my point. Yeah, right, right. But like, um, and the, but the problem, the problem, the problem is, of course, like again, if you have, if you know, if you're a woman, you have a bunch of children, you're not going to be able to perform as much of that as somebody else, right? So it's still, you know, it still, uh, it still uh, permits this gulf. Or right? if you're a man um, and you have a family yeah. uh, with lots mm-hmm. of children, you're going to have to provide uh, your your work will have to provide for more people yeah. than mm-hmm. than the the single worker um, living on his or her own. So yeah. So in terms of personal consumption or personal wealth, you know, you uh, you'll be more uh, impoverished, um, which is we, we we understand that because it, like the tax rate is different for yeah. married people and single people in, in America, for instance. Be, be well, yeah, there's the some, same amount there's of money. Partial measures, but it doesn't offset. Right. You know, yeah, still like it's, you know, um, in France, it's a little bit better. But, you know, but, right. but I just but mean the, that- the, the, the concept is there, even if it isn't well. Yeah well you know executed which is that you can't understand how rich someone is based on simply looking at their income alone mm-hmm. you have to understand what their, their the full array of responsibility and expenses ha- are mm-hmm. for that person when that and that primarily comes down when it's a worker to you know what's the size of the family that mm-hmm. they're well not just not just not just not even about about how rich they are right it's that you can't treat people um as equally able Right. Uh, well, that's you know, that's later, but right? doesn't that? No, that's, doesn't, what, that's what we're talking about now. You can't treat them as equally able. I read that you can't treat them as equally able uh, to perform work, right? Um, which still is abstracted in this way, right? If they have other commitments, right? Which aren't. Oh, okay, uh, okay, maybe. From this domain. Yeah. I thought that was more of a distribution issue, like it, it, whereas you know they have the same one hour for one hour worked, you know, one certificate for one hour worked. Um, that does not. Uh, well, it just doesn't, it doesn't far. represent, it, it just doesn't represent all forms of work. That's the problem, right? At bottom, right? You know, it's still based on, um, you know, a fissure, right? Between the kind of the forms of work, right? Which are acknowledged, um, you know, as providing labor time that can be exchanged, right? right. Um, you know, and other things. And, and so really when Mark sets it up, you know, he's pointing out that he makes a moral critique of it, mm-hmm. right? Um, and he points out that the contradictions inherent in this mechanism, you know, will become, uh, will become apparent. And this ultimately leads us to the higher stage of communism. From the lower stage right right um, my critique is different right um and you know um what i basically ask is what would it mean right um to uh, set up uh this kind of system right which is based on uh, labor certificates 
Um, and I think you immediately begin when you abolish the distinction between value and price, uh, which is you know a really really uh, crucial uh, point for Marx. Um, that this that this you know and this is why he says you know he contrasts. He always talks about how in a way um, you know in a way it was it was uh, Robert Owen right, who understood this properly, right, because Robert Owen had had earlier put forth a notion of uh, sort of labor certificates or labor money. Uh, but what differentiated Robert Owen from a lot of people that came after him, right, was the fact that Robert Owen, Owen didn't suppose a commodity producing society, that that could function within a commodity producing society, right. Mm. Um, so, uh, you know, what's, what's, what's very, very, um, uh, what's important for Marx is that, again, you don't have recourse to this distinction between value and price. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, labor time, right, is exchanged, right, for goods, uh, you know, which are created with a similar amount of labor time. Right. Um, and <clears throat> I think the question becomes, how will you actually uh, set up such a society? Right. And I think you can immediately uh, point to certain deficiencies uh, that begin to emerge. Right. Um, so one of this, you know, has to do with the, uh, the relationship between uh, supply and demand. Right. Uh, because obviously one of the functions of price, right, is to represent distinctions between supply and demand. Right. Um, so, you know, even if, you know, an equal amount of socially necessary labor time, um, you know, goes into the production of, uh, you know, apples and oranges. Right. Let's imagine. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, if there's some sort of crop rot or something. Right. And there's an extreme shortage of apples. Right. You can raise the price of apples, which is quite outside, you know, the question of the quotient of labor. Right. Or socially necessary labor actually uh, employed to 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 create those. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the first problem you kind of have is that, you know, if you're exchanging things based on an equal amount of labor time, right, um, how do you actually negotiate uh, these sort of difficulties, right? So if there's, if there's, you know, if some, if there's a much smaller quantum, right, mm -hmm. of a certain good, right, who are you going to distribute that to, right, uh, when you can't have recourse mm -hmm. to price, right, as a means of, of redistribution. Now, the second, uh, you know, another major problem, um, you know, is just uh, simply the uh, the calculation of this itself, right? Um, because this doesn't uh, just uh, touch on, and there's actually a really, really good, uh, let me pull this up. There's actually a very good, and I think, um, uh, one second. This doesn't just touch on the question superficially, right? Uh, of uh, how much labor time of the individual worker per se uh, goes into the individual thing um, or the individual product. We can see this uh, in an essay that was written by Friends of the Classless Society, uh, Contours of the World Commune, in the most recent issue of Endnotes, right? And they, mm. uh, what they say here, um, tying individual consumption to the number of working hours performed, however, is a different story, because it assumes that one could quantify the exact amount of time that has gone into making each product. Even with the most fastidious bookkeeping, which already requires a ridiculous amount of time and effort, counting the working hours embodied in even the simplest of products would be an extremely difficult task. Take a bread roll, for example. One would have to know not only how many hours of labor went into the making of, uh, of the oven, into which a whole chain of preliminary products went as well, but also how many years the oven will be in operation and how many rolls it will turn out in that time. Uh, plus, the more, take, the more one takes into account things like the means of transportation and all the other general preconditions of production, the more difficult the task, ta the more difficult the task becomes. Uh, so one, actually, I think weakness of my piece is that I probably should have uh, explored more of the debates surrounding socialist calculation because there's a whole literature. Uh, around that, you know, of course, it's already quite long. So, um, but nevertheless, I think we can all agree that this is a very, very complex thing uh, to try to work. Yeah. So, what? So, what? What? What is the aim of accurately calculating the amount of labor um, that? And, okay. So, there's two things that, that you've talked about. I want to make sure I'm keeping. Can I just? Can I just head. say the third? Can I just say the third? Sure. Yeah. Say the third thing. Yeah. Cause, yeah. Because the third, I, and I think it'll be more. It'll be concise as well. To point out the third. The third is that you know, in such a society, right? Um, there are big differences. Um, in productivity, right? In the productivity of labor, uh, which traverse any society, right? Um, right. Mm -hmm. You know, and this is, they're particularly acute when you look at, you know, different countries, right? You look at places in the third world, right? Where the productivity of labor is like much lower than in the first world, for example, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, so the third problem that I would point to, right? Um, is that if you're simply, um, you know, exchanging on the basis of time, right? Um, you're mm -hmm. effectively erasing, right? Uh, all of the distinctions between productivity, which exists now. These are represented within the nor within the normal structure of value that we have, and that Marx points out uh, illustrates in Capital, right? Mm -hmm. um, because uh, you know, uh, and, and Marx has different terms. He talks about uh, productivity, intensity, and skill, right? And we could get into that, but it's a bit complicated. But the point here is that you know, the very category of socially necessary labor time, 
right, implies that uh, there's a normative standard, right, uh, of productivity, which ossifies within, you know, a given context, right, um, you know, and your time will not be as useful as another time to the formation of value, right, if you're not functioning at that level of productivity, right? Mm -hmm. So to put this, put this, to, so to put this very, very simply, like, you know, um, I could uh, elaborately, you know, illustrate, um, you know, uh, and, and create, you know, I could a lot use a computer and, and do elaborate illustrations um, and produce, I don't know, like a Pokemon card or something, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I can't expect that because that took me 100 hours, right? Maybe I reproduce a Pokemon card that already exists. I can't expect that because that took me 100 hours, right? Um, that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that I'm going to be, that the, the, that, that the price that that good will fetch or the value of that good, for that matter, um, will reflect that, right? Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, the thing here we're really getting at, right, is because of these different levels of productivity, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, if you're giving people, if you're trying to treat time, right, as something which will be treated, to, will be exchanged directly, right, in the social consumption fund, right? And the social consumption fund, uh, as we already said, uh, you know, <clears throat> uh, collects the products of production and, re and redistributes them amongst work workers in exchange for time. Um, the result is that you're effectively subsidizing unproductive, you know, forms of production, right? Um, so that, mm -hmm. that represents what I, what I see as a third major problem to it. Um, so all of these, I think, represent pretty um, fairly substantial difficulties. But one thing I, I go into a little bit. Uh, okay, well, wait, I want to jump in and just yeah, restate sure, yeah. everything we just yeah. said and clarify it. So, okay, um, the, starting with the last thing you said, that difference in, and I, I don't recall where you started reading the quote from about where so one person might be married and the other not. But at the beginning of that paragraph, which you may have read and I didn't hear you read, um, the, what you just talked about, Marx does mention, which yeah. is that um, people will be, he says, um, uh, when you are using labor certificates, um, the equal right to, to take from the common store, the same that you put in, uh, becomes an unequal right uh, for unequal labor because not every worker is like every other. And yeah. some are have a more of an endowment, might be stronger sure. or, or quicker of the mind, more sure. uh, just have better with their hands and they're therefore more productive. So in the case of just one comparing one worker to another, one worker who takes it longer to produce the same amount of widgets per hour than yeah. the other would get the same amount of widgets back as the other. Yeah. yeah. So the, those labor certificate sure. is, is not equal. And, and yeah. one of the things, if you stop and think about the labor certificates for a while, which I think you may have pointed out as your second point is that, there is no way to really calculate how much of uh, any given commodity should be received for a certificate. What what is you know what's an hour worth in in as when measured in terms of Twinkies or iPhones or yeah. cars? It's a big, it's you a know, big, it's, a, it's a big problem. Yeah, right. And the um, the way that the Mark spends quite a bit of time in capital is explaining mm -hmm. how those relations are obtained through capitalist mm -hmm. production here. Yeah. He's not talking about the entirety of, of the system and how these relationships are set up, but really just uh, trying to address, as I said at the start, like this proposal in the Gotha program that uh, ever that what should be aimed at, is that every worker gets the full share of what they uh, the of the work that they put in, right? So, that, that's... But here's here's the problem with what with what you're saying. So I agree with you that that comes somewhat close to what I'm saying mm -hmm. on that point, right? But the mm -hmm. problem is that when Marx talks about one worker being stronger, um, you know, Marx talks about um, you know three ways, um, you know, in which uh, well, you know, three ways in which um, you know the productivity of labor, so to speak. Uh, could diverge from uh, a socially necessary standard, right? And that has to do with, it's actually, it's a big problem in his work, really, but that has to do with uh, productivity, intensity, and skill, right? So loosely speaking, we can say skill, the capacity of the worker, intensity, how hard they're kind of going, right? Um, and productivity, um, which is really, I think, often a reflection simply of automation uh, and other processes of social and managerial development, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it's not taken up like on a collective level. Right. So it's not, you know, in other words, it's not a question that's in the Gotha program or, or in the, in the Gotha in the, program. I'm saying Marx doesn't right, take no, that up right. on a collective level. So he's not talking about distinctions between nations and things like this. Right? No, so he's it, not. It's, 
it, it gets mm-hmm. to what I said. I mean, it ends up being, I think, um, well, the point he puts forth there uh, is is quite an individualistic and moralistic kind of critique, um, you know, and it's not one that really gets us into the nuts and bolts, right, of how that would really function at a broader level. Right. right. I'm not and saying it's just, completely removed from that. Right, right. And I would just say, again, that that is a consequence of the the context in which it was written, which was in response to these very abstract statements of principle in the Gotha program, um, rather than as setting down uh, a fully worked out uh, system <coughs> of, of, of uh, socialism. Um, what he's doing is, is a negative critique. He's saying, you yeah. know, look, th- these, these principles are not adequate and I can demonstrate yeah. to you exactly why. Um, well, so- indul- indul- ind- 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 indulge, indulge, me on this though um but what i want to what i wanted to just add was was that i think that it's it's very very, um it's very very interesting because i'm not going to go over uh, everything uh from the essay um but i think that if you look at uh earlier right um you know in the grunrissa um and certain other texts like the poverty philosophy right um marx attacks uh you know sort of the the adaptation of ricardian socialism which had happened in france Right. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, you had people in England. Right. Um, Like Owen. Right. Um, You know, who are, uh, you know, influenced by, uh, you know, the economic climate around Ricardo. Right. And we're trying to come up with socialistic ideas on that basis. Right. Um, And then later in France, uh, you had people like Proudhon and Derimont, Derimont, Derimont. Right. Um, Who, uh, you know, reproduce that in a slightly different way. Right. Um, you know, and uh, one of the allegations that Marx makes uh, against these people is that one of the crucial um, errors they make, right, um, is to suppose that uh, you could have anything like uh, a functional system of time chits, let's say, right, uh, within a structure in which commodity exchange is permitted, right? Now, this is like a little bit complicated because if you actually go back and examine um, the writings of Proudhon, Right. Uh, Marx actually mischaracterizes him a little bit um, because Proudhon's exact point isn't that there's going to be like time chits that people are going to exchange. Right. It's that you have like a bank de pupla that gives uh, loans, uh, you know, capital essentially freely to everyone. And that once you do that, there'll be no exploitation because everyone can get capital. So effectively, um, you know, uh, goods will exchange at value. Right. Because of that. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. So, uh, but, you know, this is the thing, right? I mean, if you think about what Marx is saying, right, um, you know, the the social consumption fund is like a completely, uh, I mean, I'm not going to say centralized, like state centralized necessarily, um, but it it proposes a a, a centralized mechanism, right, for resolving these issues. Um, And I think that um, this is very important, right, because there's no actual free exchange, for example, in the society. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And this is the thing. Right. Because if you were actually to have uh, a, uh, you know, a, you know, a society in which you tried to do something. Why do you say that there's no free exchange in such such a society? Like, like for instance, if I am in a society uh, where the state is um, like divvying out the goods from a common store um, and based on, let's say, labor certificates, there's nothing to stop me from taking the uh, widgets that I purchased from with my labor certificates and trading them for a glass of Kool-Aid from someone or giving them away uh, as a gift, Um, uh, you know, which is not quite of the both halves of an exchange, but nonetheless Mm -hmm. is a free distribution. Uh, There's no limitation. There's the, there's, I'm not limited and what I can do with the property that I purchase, um, it's just the, the – what I can't do is um, can basically take up the what is produced in its entirety or in a sector or own or rent labor, you know. But yeah. I, I can exchange – uh, whatever I like from yeah. what I take, yeah. take, you mm-hmm. know, so there's free exchange and there's no, well, no I don't think, I don't think there is, stop me. I don't think there is free exchange. I mean, I don't, I don't think that the, in other words, like, I don't think that there, because the thing is like, you're imagining a system in which you're, uh, given like, for example, like a time shit, right. For your labor. Mm-hmm. Right. And then you can take that to the social consumption fund, or, you know, I suppose you could swap it with somebody else. I mean, that presupposes something like money, right. Uh, that can be sort mm-hmm. of freely sorted. 
Um, but I think we're talking what we're talking about in Marx is more like something in which um, you know you go and you can withdraw just from that one place, right? Based on estimation of your hours. And I can tell you the reason for that, right? And Marx is pretty clear about this, right? When he writes about the earlier proposals, right? So when he talks about um, Robert Owen, right? Uh, he said that you know Robert Owen understood that uh, labor money, uh, you know, it wouldn't be uh, it wouldn't you know be um, money any more than like a, a certificate to like the theater is right in mm -hmm. other words regardless of whether you know there's more or less demand for uh you know seats at the theater right a seat for you know a ticket for a seat for the theater is good for one seat for the theater no matter what right right um, right but but you see like the the you know if you go back and you read marx's critique again i was talking about his critique of the, the proudunus right in france um you know he really really attacks them for the notion of the compatibility uh, of uh, time shits with uh, generalized exchange, right? Um, right. But if I had a, if I had a one of these certificates that was only good for one or uh, you know one ticket for the theater, yeah. And somebody else had a candy bar, and I said, "Look, I'll trade you my seat to the theater in the theater for that candy bar." That would be a free exchange. Yeah, but that's the, the problem. Is at that point they become money, right? Because as soon as you get free exchange. <laughs> They become money because as soon as you get free exchange, there's the possibility of those things, uh, you know, exchanging for more or less. Right. Well, you know, first of all, like, first of all, OK, we can go we can go look at this problem. Right. So I suppose we're imagining a context in which, you know, I have my time chit. Right. And I can exchange it for a good because there's no point exchanging just time chits. Right. Um, right. Because, you know, they have a clearly marked you know number of hours on them. Right. So you obviously wouldn't change exchange one that's worth less for one that's worth more. Um, you know, uh, but, uh, you know, if we're imagining me independently exchanging that, right, all these processes of supply and demand, right, can just reassert themselves at that level, right? So at that level, the point that Marx makes, makes right, about, uh, you know, the fact that, um, you know, Owen's um, labor money is no more money than a theater ticket is, right? Um, you know, mm -hmm. actually, uh, you understand why that is, right? Because, you, you know, you actually have to insulate the system, right, from the different factors that would cause uh, you know, the direct process of exchange characteristic of labor certificates to just becoming money again. And actually, uh, Marx criticizes um, Owen because he says Owen, Owen gets it right in as much as he doesn't suppose a, uh, suppose a commodity producing society. But Owen makes the mistake of thinking you could have bazaars that you could set up to exchange goods. Right. And Marx points out this destroys the entire thing as soon as you have that. Right. So we are talking about to that extent, we are talking about a kind of centralized apparatus. Right. Um, and I don't think there's any way of, um, you know, squaring the proposition put forth uh, with critique, you know, in critique of the Gotha program, with the idea of free exchange, um, particularly when we survey uh, the totality of Marx's comments on the subject, right? But I, I think you're confusing uh, free exchange with um, a social form which puts exchange of, of commodities uh, at the center of society. I think that you can have chaotic, uh, arbitrary, free exchanges of tickets for the theater for candy bars and the consequences socially will be minimal um it's only when you have when you actually have a universal equivalent uh called money that regulates not only distribution mm -hmm. but also the pr investment into um capital you know into production into capital that you that this problem of exchange and free exchange arises and with all of its contradictions uh, between two in, independent individuals acting on the uh, you know, just out of their own free will um, they may very well exchange like I could exchange uh, uh, my sure. very expensive camera for a pack of gum I could do that's so my free right it would be to my disadvantage. I probably wouldn't do it more than once, but that's a free exchange. Mm -hmm. um, it's not an exchange of equivalence, and it doesn't and it doesn't set up a system. Well, uh, you're talking about you're all. talking you're talking about barter, right? So in a like barter of, of goods. Um, or yeah, I'm, right, I'm not saying not, I'm not saying that I'm not saying that barter of goods would be would be prohibited. But even right? to call it barter is to, is a step too far because to call it barter is to suppose that this is somehow. Uh, a regular feature of a social of a social order, but the free well, exchange sure, in sure. isolation. All I'm saying, sure. free exchange in isolation, is simply the, the the trading of one thing for another between two free people. 
It what doesn't necessarily that, what, have what, what, to have a social form yeah. or, or regulate anything. And so, okay. like, when you say in a cap communist society, there would be no free exchange. What, what you're really saying is, like, the free exchange of goods wouldn't be the social form in which, which regulated production and what? distribution. But remember that Marx's critique, Marx's critique of Owen, right? Mm -hmm. You know, when he says that bazaars wouldn't work in the context of labor money, right? He's not criticizing Owen, you know, for, um, you know, he knows that Owen isn't proposing a commodity producing society. Owen's proposing a non-commodity producing society in which there exists, incidentally, bazaars for exchange, right? And what Marx is saying is that doesn't work, right? Now, we can he, talk was about this in uh, the poverty of philosophy? Uh, one, I mean, I can look up the, I can look up the exact, uh, one second. Cause this is, this is one argument uh, that I'm, you know, among many, I'm sure that I'm not as familiar with, but to, to, to return to let, let, let's, uh, I want to like, I think what we've reached now is the, is the turning point in our discussion. And the, the, the nifty thing about this conversation is that as, I, <laughs> as I've had it, I'm realizing that the, the, the amount of depth and, and perhaps a number of sea monsters in those depths, oh, there's uh, a lot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, are are innumerable, and so well, let me. Hey, let me, um, let me. Before we move on, can I just? I want to say something yeah. quick. I want to say that I just want to because I do point out in this, um, you know, uh, some of the points that Marx makes in his critique of Deramon, right? So this idea that you could have, you know, um, equal exchange or time chits uh, in the context of commodity production, um, and the first uh, point he makes is that it would be very very easy to hoard in this context because as productivity goes up. Right. Um, so too do the what time should it's exchanged for. Right. Uh, so there'd be a strong mm -hmm. incentive to hoard in that context. So paradoxically, while they talk about disabling the exploitative practices of banks, you know, some kind of banking or pseudo banking uh, would actually be very, very plausible in this context. Mm -hmm. uh, another one he points out is that, like, you know, if we're talking about um, capital and commodity production, I mean, it makes no sense, obviously, because you can't ex you wouldn't be able to theoretically extract surplus value in this context. So how could you on what basis would you organize collective production? Right. Um, and, uh, the third, uh, the third one is that, um, you know, differential levels of productivity corrupt the representative character, uh, of these things. So in other words, like, you know, if you had, um, you know, if you have people, uh, living in areas, right. Uh, you know, in which they're being given equal time chits, right. And the productivity of labor is very, very differential in those areas, right. You get into this major confusion, right. As soon as you get into any situation where these things are being freely exchanged, Right. Or sort of functioning like money. Right. So this is why I think Marx actually, uh, uh, you know, uh, rejects. Right. Uh, the idea of now it's one thing I said, if we're talking about, you know, I exchange we exchange two objects like as a sort of arbitrary and incidental um, form of barter. But I think what really Marx wants to do is to make sure uh, that people aren't, you know, to, to, to clarify that, um, you know, the the labor certificate is not a form of freely circulating money that you can take out and just like swap for different stuff. Right. Um, does yeah. that does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, it does. I mean, I just want to like, um, I would want to walk through uh, the the arguments carefully to make sure that um, I'm understanding each of the concepts fully before I assented to your characterization. But it's certainly on the surface of it makes sense. One of the problems um, in general of like reading something like the critique of the Gotha program or capital or, yeah. or Marx in general is that because we live in a society defined by capital, there are concepts which we presuppose, which go yeah. unexamined, which, yeah. which take a special effort um, to bring to mind. It's not even that they're difficult concepts. Once we tr do think about them, it's just that we're so accustomed to presupposing them that we don't um examine them and they they kind of operate in the background that's what i would one of the ways that i understand ideology is is when you have, so I'm, I'm very very uh, i'm very very close here, here give me this i'm very very close to my my major thesis so so okay okay say your major thesis my my so i'm very close to this so what when mark's actually in the grunrissa right when he discusses he, you know he discusses and draws delineations um, mm -hmm. You know, between people like uh, John, you know, people like uh, John Bray and Robert Owen, um, who discuss these ideas in the context of uh, a context outside of commodity production, um, mm -hmm. and people like Proudhon or uh, Derrimont or uh, John Gray, who wrote the, the work The Social System, who discuss this in the context of commodity production. But he has a particular interest um, in the work of uh, this guy, John Gray, uh, who wrote a book called The Social System, right? Um, because what he, like, you know, what what he points out, and I think what he thinks is kind of funny, 
um, is that Gray tries to go about like methodically establishing the conditions that would be needed to actually to actually make uh, labor money work, right? And in doing it, he ends up actually negating all the basic premises of commodity production, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like you know, on one hand, you know, um, the the bank, right, the general the general bank, right, um, becomes you know uh, the place where all goods are stored and distributed, right? Mm -hmm. You know, on the other hand, they become the director of all production in order to equalize different productivity levels, mm -hmm. right? So when he's making this critique. Right. Um, you know, he actually uh, articulates uh, very, very clearly. Right. And again, he's talking about how even though ostensibly for Gray commodity production exists, how it's a, a, a de facto negated in the course of his analysis. But mm -hmm. what he actually uh, makes clear is that, you know, you'd, you'd really need like a very massive and centralized apparatus. Right. In order to do this. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and so I think it's very, very striking in that context that, you know, these these propositions recur. Uh, in the in the critique of the Gotha program, and we could talk about why. I mean, I think that the Paris Commune was, uh, you know, eighteen seventy one was very influenced by the ideas of Proudhon, and I think Proudhon was having like a real moment, um, which I think maybe causes Marx to reevaluate some of his earlier thought. Um, you know, we can see that in various texts, but uh, I think that one thing you get, and this is one of my major issues with the critique of the Gotha program, is that that you know, in a way, Marx doesn't he doesn't represent you know, that earlier critique that he made, right? And not only does he not represent it, right? You know, he also sort of uses these phrases like a society of workers working in common, um, you know, and describes it as something that will arise sort of spontaneously, right? Um, but, you know, the more rigorous analysis of this, right, that we find in, in Goethe program shows how that's anything but spontaneous, right? Look, um, okay, here, here's here's uh, here's what I want to say in response to now. We will, we really will be moving on to the second half because we're, we're running, uh, you know, uh, not that much longer than normal, but I, I told you it would be 45 minutes. Sure. Sure. Well, let me, let me, let me, let me go. Let no, me no, no, no. Let me, let me respond. You can go, you can go, but on. eventually let me get, no, let me respond. Point. And then we're going to yeah. move to the okay. second half. Yeah. Okay. So here it goes. Um, what we need to land on is just precisely what, uh, is being what you, what I would think you should critique. I mean, you can object to this, but yeah. I think what you ought to be critiquing here is not on the level of um, working through adequate distribution or setting up prices or w whether or not money could be hoarded or, or so forth. But what is the presupposition or the what's in the background of Marx's critique of the Gotha program that he's presuming can be uh, uh, achieved or, or a problem that could be overcome? Um, and and do we agree that 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 it can be. He doesn't make an argument for what he ultimately arrives at um, in the critique of the Gotha program, which is that the aim of yeah. putting forward labor certificates would be to create a situation where uh, those labor certificates became irrelevant as production was uh, increased or production was made to be more creative and efficient, uh, would become the aim of life. And from each would come what they were capable of and to each would become, yeah. uh, we would go what they needed. So, um, regardless of whether Marx said it first, it is what he presumes, um, uh, is it, communism would be. And what I think he presumes would be necessary to break from, from uh, capitalism as a mode of production, the the mm. unfettered, productive, creative activity of all humanity, um, you know, as, as set apart from concerns about how many hours are worked each day, or mm. how many hours are embodied in particular uh, commodities, mm. um, but rather done through some sort of general intellect and a common mm -hmm. purpose, mm -hmm. common store of goods, but beyond that, a common aim of cr mm -hmm. creative life. Um, mm -hmm. So that's what I think that, that is at the heart of, of uh, Marx's vision is that you can see it in the critique of the uh, Gotha program. And, and I, I, I'll give you uh, an opportunity to respond to that. And then I want to talk about Moish Bastone for the second half of this sure and, sure and the yeah. dynamic okay go ahead um well, well i think what's i think what's um you know i mean i think what's what's really interesting if we look at 
uh, the history of this is the different ways that it's been taken up, right? Um, because as you say, right, there's a lot of sea monsters down there to use your verbiage. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah. Um, you know, in, in, in the final part of the essay, I kind of, I kind of break down um, what I, uh, you know, what I see as three different, uh, I use three different texts as exemplifying different responses, right? Uh, so one of these is, uh, uh, you know, by Tadayuki uh, Tusushima, who's sort of a apostate Japanese Trotskyist. Uh, it's from his book, Myths of the Kremlin. And he, I think, very, very effectively, um, you know, shows how, uh, you know, Marx's, uh, you know, labor certificates are disanalogous uh, to the idea of labor money uh, within commodity production, right? And makes some of the points that I've made so far, right, about exchange and so forth. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. But then I think that, you know, he lapses too easily into supposing that these conditions are going to be fairly easy to set up, right? He doesn't actually do the work, right, of showing all the difficulties. So, so I critique that on that basis. Uh, then I have uh, a text by, again, in Endnotes, which I earlier referenced, uh, Friends of the Class of Society, Contours of the World Commune. And I find their, their stance really funny because their view is like, well, you know, there's no obvious transitional means of getting from the lower stage of communism to the higher one, Right. Uh, and the society Marx is proposing setting is setting up is like very very acquisitive, and it probably won't be able to condition people properly to really create the higher stage of communism. So we should really just skip from capitalism to the higher stage. And I think the obvious paradox of that is how can you say on one hand that the lower stage isn't going to condition people properly for the higher stage, and then say oh we'll just go directly from capitalism, right? Um, you know, but but I do think that you know you'd have to understand a bit more about communization theory to get into that. Um, but the, uh, the, and the third one I critique is a book by, uh, Paul Cockshot and Alan Cottrell, which is called Towards the New Socialism. Um, and they have this, like, it, it's a huge, it's a real book, you know, um, and I think Cockshot's background is in like engineering or something like that, but mm. they really, really go out and try to explain how this could work, you know? Um, so they, they have all these different, you know, programs where they're going to like, you know, grade labor by productivity into different letters, mm. um, you know, and they propose, uh, sort of, um, you know, a labor credit card, right? Um, and they also uh, crucially suggest that labor prices should be shift, shifted, right? You actually adjust the labor prices to account for supply and demand, um, you know, and the labor tokens are single use only, they expire eventually, blah, blah. But I think really the problem with this is like, once you get through, like, you know, first of all, they don't actually observe the formative distinction, right? Um, you know, between, uh, you know, money and labor certificates. Right. So by permitting all these things, they kind of just transform into a new form of money. Right. They work in all these mechanisms like supply and demand. Right. No. What they what generally tends to happen is that uh, it, a proposal is put forward or a hundred thousand proposals are put forward in order to properly manage capitalist production and exchange um, from, you know, from the perspective of a socialist state. And mm -hmm. um you can call it labor, labor certificates or you can call it uh, labor chits or you can have, uh, you know, make it. I think at one point David Harvey suggested maybe uh, instead of money, everyone should use uh, something that um, like wheat, something that will have a, a, you know, a certain shelf life and then become <laughs> useless um, so that you can't can't, can't accumulate. Uh, yeah, I, I think that was, you know something he played around with briefly in the late <laughs> wheat. 2000s right, right around but yeah it wasn't maybe wheat but it was some sort of you know uh uh so some sort of good that was that would deteriorate uh wouldn't wouldn't be able to you couldn't hoard it when and hold on to its value because its use value would deteriorate um but uh, here, here's what i want to get to with with um Okay, I want to go back. Well, to let me, let me, just, let me just say, let me just say finally about about Cockshot. Yeah. I'm just going to say this and Cottrell. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think it's not. You know, I think ultimately this proposal ends up as a really awkward, um, you know, mushy middle because it's like if you're going to do all these things right and basically just make labor certificates into money, then why not just use money, right? I mean, I think this was the conclusion Lenin. Right, reached. I know, and as a contemporary, Len, I think Lenin this, this is your solution. It's like why bother abandoning capitalism at all? Well, no, no, I, 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 you know, I want to get, is, we're I want to get beyond, and... I want to get beyond capitalism. If you have, if you have a, a system that doesn't work very well, I mean, and this is what Lenin knew when in State and Revolution, mm -hmm. right? He made two crucial additions to this text. The first one, he stretches the dictatorship of the proletariat into the into the lower stage of communism, right? And mm -hmm. the second one, right, he eliminates all the references to labor certificates, right? Um, so he clearly was just putting distance himself, uh, putting distance between himself uh, and this idea, which he saw uh, as unworkable. But but I mean, I think in general, I think the, the worst thing in a way about this text, right, um, which, again, I don't want to 
reproach Marx for too much because the text was never meant to be published and on and on. But I think the worst thing about this text is that, you know, there's a really, really, um, you know, I mean, it's, it's within a kind of context in which there's uh, collective ownership of the means of production. Um, but there's a really, really strong focus on, uh, you know, exchange, right, which makes it, you know, quite, you know, in that respect, and in certain ways, it resembles, uh, you know, the work of the, the Proudunists, for example, uh, or the Ricardian socialists. Um, and I think that, you know, um, Marx had had already earlier, earlier distanced himself from that when he said, we're going to go to the hidden abode of production, right? That's really the, the point of capital in a way, right, is in many ways to approach this kind of thinking. Um, and I think we see this sort of neo prudonism right, which is very, very common in our society. I think you see it everywhere from the politics of Occupy, right, um, right through to, you know, sort of like crypto, um, you know, and smart contracts, right? This idea like, you know, if we just alter the means of exchange somehow, everything's, everything's going to be okay. Right. Um, you know, mm -hmm. workers will be able to make the value of their labor. Right. But ultimately, this isn't going to work within capitalism. Right. And I think we're already seeing, you know, the nefarious ends uh, that these different technologies can be used for. Right. So, I mean, even right. even if you even if you look at something like smart contracts, it's like, OK, you know, I'm able to work without a uh, capitalist overseer. Right. I get the value that I produce. Right. But then there's going to be a capitalist right beside you who exploits labor, gets way bigger, puts you out of business, monopolizes the sector. Okay, right. so listen, I'm, I'm now going to move on to the second half of this conversation. If you enjoyed this conversation, please do consider supporting us on Patreon. Our patrons help to make sure that Sublation Media can continue to provide interviews, videos, books, and articles that are critical of the left from the left. If you are tired of remaining stuck within bourgeois ideologies and politics, help us sublate them both.